I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise will continually be in my mouth. I'm Alvin L. Daniels, Jr. Again, uh, welcome again to the um, Southeastern School of Biblical um, uh, Studies as we continue our sojourn um, with uh, this um, lesson of uh, the life of Christ. And we continue this journey, and we are on about lesson lesson three, lesson four, and we're going to try to uh, do two things simultaneously in this particular uh, session. We're going to finish off uh, the question of, um, of what is he, and then we're going to skip over to lesson number four, who do men say that he is? And again, as is our tradition, we'll go to God in prayer. O oh, kind of blessing, Father, we thank you, Father, for being God and good. Thank you for the many multitude of blessings that thou hast bestowed upon us. We thank you, Father, for this time that we have uh, to share, student and teacher, uh, in your holy and your divine uh, word. We pray, Father, that you would look down upon us. Be pleased, Father, give us your power, give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, because you are all of our teachers, Father. And we thank you, Father, for the privilege of investigating your truth. Thank you now. Use me as a vessel. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Um, what is he? And we've been looking at the complex duplex of Jesus Christ, the multidimensional nature of, of Jesus Christ, Christology as it were. We have been looking at the flesh of Jesus. We've been looking at the spirit of Jesus. We've been looking at his divine appointment, his call, and we've been trying to size him up as as Mary's baby uh, as, as well. And so it is very uh, important for us uh, to see Jesus in, in all lights. And so uh, the more we see him, the more we understand him, if we're able to peel back some of these layers to see who Jesus uh, is uh, in terms of his uh, divinity and also of his humanity, it increases our awareness um, it uh, crystallizes our understanding so that we can be better teachers, better uh, preachers of, of the word uh, of God. And moreover, our understanding, our understanding will be uh, uh, enlightened. Um, and so in this session, we're going to, we, we have been going behind the veil, so to speak. We've been going behind, um, if you would, just the plain old reading of, of scripture. We've been trying to get back and look at Jesus historically, because looking at Jesus historically gives us that multi-dimensional view of who uh, Jesus is and uh, helps us uh, again to appreciate what God sent to us in the form of uh, his son, uh, Jesus uh, the Christ. So uh, what is he? And I think our, our lesson uh, in this section hinges on, we can go both ways with this, we can go back, we can go forward as well. Matthew 16, 18, which is a, a very um, a very thumb-worn text for us members of uh, uh, the Church of Christ because it has become, uh, in many ways, a proof text uh, to prove to us that Jesus Christ is the builder of uh, the church. There is, in fact, one church. There's much more to the text than that, although that can be, uh, that is appreciated. Um... There is so much more uh, to that particular text, and we'll take a look at that one. That will be our springing board for what we will um, uh, discuss and discourse about um, in this particular session. Okay, so let's find it. Matthew 16, 18. And we know it's, it's, it's Peter's confession of Jesus Christ being, um, being um, uh, the Messiah, the Christ. He came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi. So when we approach uh, approach this text and other texts like it, um, why Caesarea Philippi? Why does Jesus travel several, several miles to go to Caesarea Philippi to, um, to make this declaration and um, query the disciples about who he is? What's the significance of that? Why does he leave one place and then he goes to another place, get the question answered, make the declaration, and then he comes back? Well, that's, that's all significant as we consider um, what is he and, and, and who do men say that um, uh, Christ, Christ is. And so to do this, we're going to have to climb into the Jewish mindset. And climbing into the Jewish mindset, we're going to have to put on a different hat. We're going to have to approach the text historically. 
not in terms of its canon, but it, historically, what 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 are the Jews thinking about Jesus, who are steeped and adept in in biblical knowledge, historical knowledge about the coming Christ? And so, just let me give you this early: uh, Christ is the kingdom bringer. Christ is the kingdom bringer. Bringer. And so, all of the Jews are waiting participatorily for a a a coming. Messiah, the Jews would say. And because we're speaking uh, Greek right about now, he's, he's the Christ, which uh, is essentially the same thing. So the Jewish mindset is we're under Roman uh, oppression, suppression. We've been taxed to no end. Where is this, uh, where is this deliverer? He's been prophesied in the scriptures. He has been coming down through the ages, and each generation has their own level of anticipation of when uh, the Christ will come. And so the question is asked over and over again, and I don't have to take you there. Peter's asking the question, the disciples are asking the question, and they're asking this question of Jesus. <clears throat> when exactly are you going to uh, restore uh, uh, of the kingdom? He's the, he's the kingdom. And if, you, if we try... Uh, to understand the gospels outside of Christ being this kingdom bringer, we're going to miss him. We're going to miss him, and we're going to miss a view of Jesus. We're going to miss some of the dialogue that's taking place between Christ, the Pharisees, uh, and the Jews generally. We're going to miss it uh, because as we see it, he's, he's, Christ, he's, the, he's the guy that's going to die for us. Jews... No, not not so much, not so much, not so much as the guy that's gonna die for us, but the guy that's gonna live for us, and that's why there is this um, uh, combative uh, uh, intercourse between uh, Peter and, and Jesus. It's, it's almost filled with tension. We're not there, but we can kind of glean that from the text. Christ says, "You know, fellows, uh, let me let me prepare y'all for my death." I'm, 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 I'm going to be out of here. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer many things. It's, it's messing Peter up, especially, and also the uh, other disciples, because no, no, no. Listen, you can't you can't restore and die, because if you die, um, that's the end of the restoration. You, you, you're the Messiah. You said you were the Christ, right? Um, the, the, the son of the living God. You said that you were the Messiah. <laughs> and, and, and um, well, Let's do this. Let's uh, let's let's forget about the divinity of, of Jesus just for a moment. As difficult as as that is, let's forget about that. These guys are not looking for divinity. They're not looking for somebody that's coming out of heaven. <laughs> They're looking for a man born of born of born of woman uh, that's born somewhere around Bethlehem, Judea, Nazareth. Uh, and they're looking for this guy, and they don't care anything about you know uh, his 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 ascension uh, from heaven. They're looking for a kingdom bringer. So this abrasion between Peter um, uh, and and Christ, I'm going to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders. They're gonna kill me, and then I come back. Not so, Lord. Not so, Lord. These things uh, uh, ain't, ain't gonna happen to you. And the disciples, the, the, the 12, that, that hear Jesus say this stuff over and over and over again. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. It does not bode well with them. It does not sit well with them because it is a departure and aberration from their uh, Jewish Jewish mindset. They want deliverance. They want kind of like a king. And as you know, they try to compel him to be a king on 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 several occasions, at least a, a couple that we can read about in the scriptures. Maybe there's more than that. So when we open this Jewish door and we go in and walk the historical corridor, we're, we're going to see something uh, totally different. So, <clears throat> kingdom bringer, that's who, that's who Christ is uh, for them. That's their mindset as they follow him. Um, martyrdom, maybe. Martyrdom, maybe. So the question arises that if and when you die, not that you've come to die, but if and when you die, who's going to be next? Who's going to sit on your right? Who's going to sit on, on, on your left? Because we will facilitate the kingdom of God for you. Um, uh, and so let's, let's go back. Let's go back. Let's look at uh, 
Mark has it, of course, in Mark uh, uh, chapter number um, 8 has this account, but we're going to look at Matthew's account because we're far more familiar with Matthew's account than we are Mark. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they say, Some are, some say that thou art John, or the Baptist, some Elijah, uh, some uh, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, Who say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. Um, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon by Jonah, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father, which is in heaven. And I said unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church in the gates of You know that whole bit. Okay, so, um, why Caesarea Philippi? Because Caesarea Philippi is a place that they make money, the Roman uh, government. Uh, it is a somewhat a, a, a centrality of the political system of all Judea. Um, Herod is, is of course, uh, somewhat a, an appointed director of the affairs. He's, he's, not, he's not Caesar, uh, but he has been given a territory uh, which to rule. He's accountable uh, to Caesar and to the Roman to the Roman government. He's part Jew himself. Caesarea Philippi is a place that they make up money. It is a citadel for the um, Roman government as well. It is a somewhat a headquarters, if you would, for the Roman government in that particular uh, area. Jesus goes there uh, for this specific purpose, ask this question of his disciples. Uh, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And so these are not arbitrary names um, folks, these are not arbitrary names when Peter stands up and he throws out e Elijah. Some say that you John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Well, why specifically these uh, particular names? Because all of these particular names are associated with the kingdom br bringer. What Jesus is, he's the kingdom, he's the kingdom bringer. Uh, and so John the Baptist, uh, so let's deal with John the Baptist as... Uh, really one of the signals that Jesus sends as the Jews see him in practice, in his ministry. First century uh, Jerusalem. Why John the Baptist? Because he's powerful. He's a, he's a powerful orator. He's a powerful teacher. Uh, he's John the Baptist because John the Baptist has been uh, beheaded at this particular time. And, and at this particular time, Herod even believed that uh, there was his resurrection of, of, of John the Baptist. Well, who's John the Baptist? Well, John the Baptist is sometimes conflated with Elijah. Who's Elijah? He's the guy that was taken uh, and uh, he, he didn't die. So this is the resurrection of, uh, of that guy. Remember, he was taken up in the whirlwind. We don't know exactly where he went. We surmise that he went back to heaven, but he could have went to some other place. And this is him all over again. He's this powerful preacher. He's anointed by God. So John the Baptist is uh, in the wilderness. He's teaching, preaching about the kingdom. Okay. And he is the forerunner uh, of Christ. And so he's the forerunner of the kingdom as the Jews uh, would, would see him. He's a powerful preacher. Legend now sets into this. It figures into this uh, greatly because legend says... <clears throat> That um, that guy that's out there preaching, he's got on the same outfit that Elijah used to wear uh, in in the Old Testament, and that's where his efficacy comes from. He has this he has this um, uh, great power as he preaches and teaches, and he has the same diet uh, as 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 Elijah. He has this he has this um, uh, camel's hair. And he has a leather uh, girdle. And legend has it that this is the exact same outfit that Elijah wore back in the days that someone tucked this outfit away. They put it in the back of the uh, in the back of the ark, and it has been preserved over many, many years. John the Baptist shows up, he puts it on, and he preaches. And many people confuse John the Baptist with Jesus because of the efficacy of, of his uh, of his preaching. And oftentimes there is this confusion between Jesus Christ uh, and John to the degree uh, that I think if you get over there in, in the Gospel of, of, of Luke, you almost see them, okay, we're going to, 
Okay, we'll 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 jump back on. 